You want to see the experience, comic culture, and sales. Streaming live daily to Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter. Hey, everyone. So after this show, you know, they do the sales show, the uh, Rex and John, and they have a lot of cool things on there. But today, they've got a statue. Check this out. So if you're a Watchmen fan, this is a pretty cool statue. I like it. I like little gems at the bottom. and Yeah. So after this, check out, check out the show and uh, maybe you can buy that statue off of them. I might. Maybe you'll bid against me. We'll see. All right, everyone. Stick around for the Dan Wickline Show. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Dan Wickline Show here on The Experience. Today, we are going to talk about The Rings of Power, the final episode of the first season. We are going to talk about the latest episode of Quantum Leap and how, at this point, I think I'm a fan of the show. Wasn't planning on it. I blame Kyle, but I'm kind of into it now. Still got issues with it, but we'll talk about it. Hello, Triple B. I'm glad you got through the season. Uh, yeah, pumped for the new season. I am too. I, I love some of the things they showed us. Slip, how you doing? Oh, I like the uh, rock and roll whiskey. And uh, yep, I, I, I uh, my, my, my bass guitar is in the other room, and my whiskey's right here on the floor. So, if you think I'm kidding. That's just the one I have in reach. Uh, I learned that if you drink straight whiskey, you don't have to drink a lot. So, you know, it's not a matter of constantly buying. You just buy one, you sip it, and you're good for the evening. So, cool. Good to see you. All right. We got JD on the board. And uh, we're going to cover a bit of news. There's two news stories coming out today that I think are, are worth covering. Ooh, a Glenn Fittich 12. It's my good. This is a 14, actually. I think it's 14. Yeah, this is the 14. But 12 is good. Um, well, I could do a show on, on, on scotches. Um, my One of my favorites is um, Octothorpe. Not Octothorpe, Octomore. I had one that's probably just the most amazing kick ass scotch I ever had. But I love a good Lagavulin or Lefroig as well. So, yeah. If you guys want to send me Christmas gifts, I'm up for uh, good scotches. Glenn Finnich and Johnny Walker is also a good one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Highland Park. I had a Highland Park 21 once that was just smooth as hell. I loved it. So, um, also, uh, Belveni puts out a really good one that's their Caribbean cask. So they actually age it in a uh, in a rum barrel, and uh, that is also very nice. So, yeah, maybe maybe uh, during the holidays when we're having a hard time finding a a good uh, good topic for a day, we'll we'll come to, we'll do whiskey talk. Yes, we'll do a Wednesday whiskey talk before the holidays. So if you're looking to buy a whiskey for someone, let me give you some advice. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be fun. All right. Um, so news stories. One of the big ones has to do with DC. And it's it's something we've been expecting. And it's just been, it's more been a matter of time than a surprise. And that is, of course, Walter Hamada has left Warner Brothers Discovery. It's been expected for a while. We kind of knew he was on the way out. He's been with Warner Brothers for 15 years 
He's been the head of DC Films for the last four. Uh, but according to reports, is his office is cleared out and they're just negotiating the final exit payout. So, which it, it's a little surprising though that he's going now because he was one of the producers on and kind of ushered in Black Adam. You know, so you would think he would want to stick around at least through the weekend, enjoy the, the revelry of it doing well, because it's looking to open up for $135 million for the box office, which is a good opening. So, I mean, that's what it's tracking at right now. Um, but, yeah, he's already packed up and is out. And, uh, you know, and, and we knew he was going to leave. You know, he's been on the way out the door. He's the fifth executive to leave since David Zaslav took over. But, you know, like I said, it's it, the writing's been on the wall. He, But he's done some good stuff. You know, he made the, uh, the Peacemaker spinoff happen. He made the Penguin series happen. Um, he's been involved with, like, the Lego movies and stuff like that. So, you know, he's, he's done a lot when he was there. Um, the Aquaman movies, the Joker movie, those were all things that he ushered in. So it's not like his thing wasn't completely successful, but the whole fallout with Zack Snyder and, yeah. So it just didn't work out for him. Uh, Slip says, glad Hamada is gone. He's been weighing DC down. Uh I'm looking forward to seeing Black Adam. I am too. Um, it really, how quickly I'll see it has to do how well I, I'm, I'm having a uh, an outpatient surgery on Friday. How long I'm laid up will tell me when I'll see Black Adam. But hopefully I'll get to see Black Adam next week at some point, and then we'll be able to talk about it. Uh, tomorrow I will put together a little uh, primer on the character of Black Adam and maybe the other you know, Dr. Fate and Hawkman and stuff for anybody who doesn't know. Just a brief one as we also talk about the latest Andor. But I'll get you, I'll try to get you guys ready for the movie if you if you don't have the back knowledge. Because I know a, a lot of the reviews right now are coming out saying it's this big action picture, but there's not a lot of character development. You that they they almost expect you to know who these characters are or the backstories on these characters. So let me see if I can help you guys out with that before heading off to the theater. So, so yeah, that's the one news story is that Walter Hamada is, is leaving. They still don't have a new head of DC Films. Uh, Michael DeLuca is kind of filling that role in until they get somebody. They were going to try to get Dan Lin, and that fell through. So it'll be interesting to see what's going to happen next. Now, um the next bit of news I wanted to talk about is another one of those rumors that uh, are swirling around about the Marvel Universe. I may have mentioned this yesterday. I don't remember. But that is that Sasha Baron Cohen is being talked about as coming on board to play Mephisto. Now, what I'm hearing is that Deadline has gotten somebody from Marvel, an insider at Marvel, to confirm that... Cohen has been seen at Marvel and that he's involved with the Ironheart series. Now, the, it's a, everybody's leaning that he's going to be Mephisto, and it makes sense because Mephisto is tied into the villain of Ironheart, which is Parker Robbins, or the Hood is you know what his character goes by. And of course, the Hood and the boots that he gets are created by Mephisto. So it makes sense that Mephisto would show up at some point in the story. <coughs> There's also speculation that he'll continue on and uh, be Mephisto in like Agatha Heart, House of, uh, not House of Heart, just now it's Chaos, of Coven of Chaos. So we're looking at that Sasha Baron Cohen may literally be joining the MCU. It's not super confirmed, but it's it's getting pretty obvious. You know, it's it's kind of that that almost the Harrison Ford level where 
enough people are talking about it that that take the, that do things properly to do the right ways that you start believing them. Um, I'm going to come back to that slip in just a minute. But the other character that some people are saying, well, maybe what he's coming on board for, and that is uh, Dormammu. Because in the first appearance of Dormammu, they just had um, Benedict Cumberbatch voice him, and he's a, just a CGI creation. But when they get to the point of actually having him as a character, I de people doubt that uh, Benedict will do double duty again. You know, if the, if, uh, the third Doctor Strange movie has Dormammu in it, since Clea's in it, it makes sense, Dormammu, that they're not going to have him be the guy, you know, again. So, but I think the Mephisto one is probably more likely. And I think facially he kind of works for it. Uh, so Cohen has this long face. And, you know, so it kind of, Mephisto has that same design. So, yeah, I where I normally see him as Borat and those other characters, I kind of like this one. I kind of like the idea of him being Mephisto. So we'll have to see how that pans out. Okay, Slip, you said a lot of people have been saying that The Rock should take the Kevin Feige role for DC. Um, My... I disagree with that idea because what they're looking for is the Kevin Feige type. And the thing about Kevin Feige is he's kind of the, the backbone of Marvel. He's the creative force behind it. And that's all he does. If you're going to bring somebody in, to control the universe. And look, there's a point now where they're talking about maybe they need a second Kevin Feige at Marvel to run the television side so that, you know, he can focus on the movies because there's so many projects going on at the same time. And, and so you don't want to bring in somebody who is doing multiple jobs. You don't want somebody like, uh, you know, somebody said that Matt Reeves or um, Todd Phillips or just some of these other names have been floating around there. No, those people are writers and directors. That's what they do. Let them do that. You need someone who is a producer, who knows how to produce, how to put things together, how to schmooze uh, creative people. Because uh, I mean, that's what Kevin Feige does is he goes out there and he convinces Harrison Ford to take over a role left by William Hurt. He convinces Robert Redford to come in and play the bad guy in a Captain America movie, or Tommy Lee Jones to play a colonel in a Captain America movie, or Gary Shandling, or... I mean, just think of some of the names that they've gotten to come in and how that's worked out. You know, Michael Douglas and Michelle Pfeiffer as Ant -Man and the, the original Ant-Man and the Wasp. He, he gets these people and he has these meetings. That is a job unto itself. The Rock is an actor first and he produces his own movies. I'll give him that. But you want him on the screen. You know, Black Adam, is. if it works, it's because of Dwayne Johnson. Not because the producer behind it did a good job. Because, you know, it's just going to be People are going to go see the movie because of Dwayne Johnson and Pierce Brosnan and Aldous Hodge. And they want to see that. And some people are now want to see it because of Henry Cavill, but yeah. You know, um, yeah. So I, I, I like how people are fans of his, but the rock does a certain type of movie. Now I understand that black Adam is, is something different for him. You know, I've really seen some of the reviews that talk about how this is the first time that The Rock isn't coming across as really good or really nice. He's coming across as an anti-hero. He's coming across as dark and good for him. I'm glad he embraced that role and is willing to do that because that'll open up new things for him. 
And if he does it well, that'll be great. You know, maybe even turn to the point where he starts playing a villain occasionally just to mix things up. I mean, yeah, sure, there was the Scorpion King, but do we really count that? Um, so, yeah, I nothing against The Rock. You know, he puts out – he knows how to pick co-stars for himself, how to find the people to work off of, whether it's Kevin Hart, Jack Black, Amy Pond – not Amy Pond. The woman who played Amy Pond. Um, just down the line, he finds the right co-stars, but – do you want him making the decisions on who's going to be the next Batman or Superman or any of that stuff? Yeah, I think I think the end credit scene in Super Pets was his nod to change the change in character. Yeah, he has been pushing for years. And Walter Hamada's exit. Walter Hamada's is one of the people who did not want Henry Cavill back as Superman. And now that he's gone and David Zaslav is there, we're getting Henry uh, Cavill back. So, Karen Gilliam. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Slip says, The Rock played a dark character in Doom. I thought he was a great villain in that. Yeah. In, the early, in his early acting, he did a lot of villains. But then he took on these you know, heroic roles in uh, the Jumanji movies and the Fast and the Furious movies. And, you know, he's kind of got that role now, or even the, uh, what was the movie he just did with Ryan Reynolds and Gal Gadot? Read something or, you know, again, he plays the good guy until the twist. And, yeah. You know, so I like seeing him branch out or go back to the darker characters. And I am really looking forward to this movie. And I'll tell you in all honesty, Pierce Brosnan is the first reason I'm going to see that movie. Pierce Brosnan is Dr. Fate had me right there. Red notice. Thank you. Then Aldous Hodges Hawkman was my number two. Then we get to the rock. So yeah, if they said it was a Dr. Fate movie with Pierce Brosnan and I'd be there. Aldous is awesome. He was one of the best parts of uh, leverage. And um, I, I got to meet him for a couple minutes at a convention. He just, uh, at San Diego Comic-Con, he walked by and um, I was doing a signing, I believe at the Avatar table and he just, or, or maybe Zenoscope, and he came by and just, oh, hey, what you doing? We talked for a little bit and just super nice guy. But yeah, Triple B, when, when I see The Rock, I only see The Rock and I understand that. And I think that's the part of the problem with the, uh, some of these wrestlers is they become so much the persona they do in wrestling that it's hard for them. It's hard for people to disassociate themselves with that. You know, I mean, some wrestlers have been able to pull it off, but I mean, how many people still see John Cena or don't see him when they see the peacemaker, you know, stuff like that. Uh, Aldous Hodge, uh, you should watch leverage especially if you can go back to the original series when Timothy Hutton was still in it. It is brilliant writing, brilliant acting. It is a fun uh, series with a bunch, like every episode is a heist, you know? Yeah. City, city on the Hill. Who does he play opposite on that? Kevin Bacon. Is it Kevin Bacon and Aldous Hodge? Uh, yeah. Uh, what was it? Uh, Jay said, hang on. spam call. Um, it's like Will Smith for me. Will Smith is always going to be Will Smith, but I'm okay with that. Yeah, John, we're, that's what we're talking about with, uh, we all want to, we can't wait to see Black Adam. Hawkman will be the first, first performance I'll see of his. Well, cool. I think you'll like him. He's a really good actor. So, yeah, if you get a chance to go back and see Leverage, they just started doing new episodes of it. Uh, I think you can see them on Amazon Prime. But I loved when uh, Timothy Hutton was part of it. And, you know, it was just a great series. It, it was funny. That was on and White Collar was on. And around the same time, they were running about the same time. And those were my two favorite shows on the air for a long time. You know, 
and then they both ended. So, all right, uh, let's see. We're at the 20-minute mark. Let's go ahead and we will take our first break. And when we come back, let's uh, talk a bit about Quantum Leap. And then we'll talk about the uh, season finale of One or the Ring of Power. I always want to say the One Ring, Rings of Power. So we'll be right back. Did you know that every experience show, including some exclusive content, streams on Twitch? Check it out. Twitch.tv forward slash the underscore EXP. Or just scan that QR code. There's something for every imagination at your local comic shop. Visit ComicShopLocator.com to find a store near you. Hey, Hey, it's producer Kyle. If you like going places where the action never stops like Las Vegas, the Caribbean, and Atlantic City, then you're probably not who I want to talk to. But if you want to surround yourself with amazing comic books and comic book content, Made by a devoted group of smart and funny industry insiders, the Experience Members Club was made for you. You can join the Experience by becoming a supporting member of our YouTube channel. You get access to exclusive content that no one else gets, like members-only live streams, pre-sales, one-on-one Q&As with production staff, and other content that's exclusively for members. Plus, for a limited time if you sign up now, you'll be entered into our giveaway of a slabbed comic book. Just call this 1-8... Eight- Wait, hold on. It's 2022. No one makes phone calls anymore. Scan the QR code at the bottom of the screen or just visit the membership section of our YouTube page and you'll be on the VIP line of the comic book buffet, baby. Look at the size of those perks. Join today and I'll be saying, who loves you, baby? Me. The, the, the answer was me. Welcome back to the Dan Wickline Show. We are going to be talking about Quantum Leap, but I wanted to uh, say one other thing about leverage that I brought up. Uh, one of the fun things about leverage is the writer of the show, and his name slips my mind right now, but he's kind of a comic geek like the rest of us, and he would sneak in little Easter eggs all the time. Uh, there was one episode in particular that they were um, in an airport and they had to quickly get tickets. And their computer guy, Dan, yeah, Dan Rogers, um, they, their computer guy, who's Aldous Hodge, said, okay, what passport or what uh, pa- passports do you have on you? Because Hutton always had a bunch of passports. And he would read off the names. And all of the names were uh, actors who had played John Rogers. That's better. I thought that was wrong. Um, all of the names were people who had played Doctor Who. So it's like I got uh, Tom Baker, uh, Sylvester McCoy, John Pertwee, you know, or another one. I believe the code names were uh, Alan Scott and Jay Garrick. So there was always these little comic book Easter eggs or pop culture Easter eggs hidden in the show that w- is just there for us. They're, you know, so Leverage is a really fun show. All right, let's talk Quantum Leap. I have had an interesting reaction to Quantum Leap. Uh, The first episode, I wasn't that thrilled with because I was comparing it to the original Quantum Leap. And to me, the original Quantum Leap 
was all about the, uh, the, the story of whoever he leapt into. And then every once in a while, Al would show up. But what was happening back at the base and back in the original you know, current time, that didn't matter much. There wasn't a story there. We didn't care about that. We cared about where Sam had jumped into and what was the story. The first episode was maybe 30, 40% about where this new guy, Ben, jumps into and about 60, 70% about the fact that he jumped at all and that he wasn't the one supposed to jump and why did he do it and the betrayal and oh, his ex-wife or his uh, fiance is supposed to be the jumper. Now she has to go help. There's all this backstory they set up. And you didn't get that in the first one. You pretty much had uh, Sam wake up on, on the coast or on, on, on a river and he's fishing and Al shows up and fills him in. That was it. Uh, JD says, I did like that about the original. It also kept the mystery going because we only ever got the story from Beckett's point of view and the information level. Exactly. So that's one of the big differences. And they're spending a lot of time with the supporting characters. And they're spending a lot of time with drama involving the supporting characters. Do they trust each other? Why should they trust each other? Is Ben lying to them? Did Ben do this on purpose? Why is Ben working with Al's daughter? How do we capture Al's daughter? You know, oh, somebody from the government's here to check up on our progress. How do we keep them from knowing that Ben jumped when he wasn't supposed to? It's just, it's like a soap opera when it comes to that side of it. But then we go and follow Ben Dr. Ben Song, the new jumper or the leaper. And this guy is as perfect of casting as Scott Bakula was because you like him. He is very likable. He is very engaging. And you just, you know, you want him to succeed. Even though he's done all this stuff we don't know about, you still want him to succeed. And, you know, but he also, he, he's got some personal feelings. He doesn't want to kill anybody, even though there's supposed to be a duel. He doesn't want to, you know, he, he wants to help people. He, you know, so those stories are still great. And they've made some big changes, like the whole thing that you can jump around in your own lifetime. That's out the window. Last night they went to 1800 something, you know, I say last night, I watched it last night. It was actually Monday night, Monday or Sunday. I don't remember which night it airs on. Um, but yeah. And uh, one of the th concepts they had in the original series is that whoever he leaps into that consciousness ends up in the waiting room and they could, you know, talk to him and find out information from them. That's out. They've thrown that part of it out altogether. And we learned the previous week that not only is that out, but uh, now when somebody gets leaped into, they basically just black out and wake up a day or two later when Sam leaves. And we know that because one of the supporting characters, a guy named Admiral, uh, Admiral Magic, they call him Magic, uh, who is uh, played by Ernie Hudson, is someone that the original Sam leapt into. And it it's they took the character from one of the original episodes and they just aged him up to be Ernie Hudson. So that part I liked, but there are still a lot of surprise twists going on. Assassin's Creed series reveal incoming. Josh? Is that something, a new breaking news? Slip says, I like seeing references in the movies. I saw one recently in Morbius. The boat he was on was called the Mar yep, a nod to the director of Nosferatu F.W. Murnau, Murnau. Yes. Is there an Assassin Creed series? Not seeing anything on Deadline yet. Okay. 
if that does break, we will uh, grab the article. Um, but they've been doing stuff in the series that I do like a lot. Besides, like I said, Ben, I like the interaction. I like the characters in it. It's just, it's there's a lot of drama. But last night they did something that I don't remember ever happening in the original series. It might have, but I'm thinking no. Ben leapt into somebody in the 1800s, and right before he was about to leap out, somebody walked up to him, and uh, actually I should pause for a minute. Put the spoiler thing up for me, please. Because if you're not current, this is a spoiler. Hey, Lyle, glad to see you. Josh says, no, joking that since he can jump past his own... Oh, I see what you mean. Go back to ancient Rome. Got it, Josh. So, um, the spoiler thing is, at the end of the episode, he's in this uh, older Hispanic man's body or Latino man's body, and somebody comes up to him and tells him, you shouldn't have come here, Ben. You've got to, you know, stop following me around. And he goes, wait, you know who I am? He goes, yes, I know you're Dr. Ben Song, you know, and, and, you know, and that's you're from the year 2022. And it's like, wait, is that another leaper? There's been talk about them having evil leapers. Now, I don't know if this is an evil leaper, if this has to do with some of the subplot that's going on in the current time, the fact that um, Al's daughter is hacked into this into Ziggy, that she's got Al's old communication device. You know, is she putting leapers out there? And was this guy already there? You know, it's like they opened up this whole new possibility and suddenly I'm like, okay, this just got really damn interesting. Because, I mean, the other show was basically... Sam leaping, 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 fixing people's lives, hoping he can leap again, and eventually he'd leap home. And, of course, we all know he never made it home. And I thought, well, maybe that that's what Ben's doing, is he and he, he's trying to track down Sam so that he could bring him home. This, this is something altogether different. I don't know if this means that there is another government agency doing this, if this is from a different time period, you know, or we don't know because this was Ben looking at the guy. So he would look at the body that leapt into not the person. It might have been Sam. For all I know, that could have been Sam. And he was telling Ben he shouldn't have come there because it's going to be hard for him to get out. So that, I mean, that just opened up an incredible amount of possibilities on who that guy was. Because, you know, we're not going to be able to tell by the body because he's leapt into somebody. So assuming he's a leaper, maybe he time travels differently. I don't know. The, it just got really interesting with that change. And now I don't know where it's going, but I'm suddenly very interested where I was just kind of getting into it a little bit and like, Oh yeah, it's a good show to talk about. And Kyle, Kyle wanted me to cover it. So I'm going to cover it. And now I'm like, what the hell? So now I got to see what that twist is. And I got to wait till next weekend for that. It's like, oh man, I'm kind of, I want to know what's going on. So, uh, if you haven't watched it yet, it's a really good cast, um, and I, the show is getting better. And they just um, NBC just ordered the back set, so it's going to be 19 episodes, season one, and there's a good chance it'll get a season two if the numbers keep up. So it's worth jumping in on. And maybe we'll find out what happens to Sam. 
Maybe we'll finally get that answer. I want it. You know, it, it went way too long. You know, with uh, Sam Beckett never made it home. Oh, you bastards. So, Slip says, the butterfly effect is similar to Quantum Leap, except Austin Kutcher only leaps back into his younger self. Yeah. See, that's the thing with time travel. You Time travel can work however you want it to work. But once you create the rules, you got to stick to them. It's kind of like vampires. Um, you could have vampires that can, you know, survive in the daylight, and you can have vampires that burn in the daylight. You could have them that drink blood, that only need, only like to drink blood, but can eat, sustain on other things. You can do anything you want. They're fictional characters. As long as you set the rules early on, and then stick to them as you go. Um, I ended up doing a, a forward for a, a vampire novel called Wasting the Dawn that IDW put out. And that's ended up being what I talked about. Because the vampires in that book were very different than your classic vampires. And it's like, don't expect your classic vampires because... Anybody can make vampires being how they want it to be. And time travel works the same way. As long as you explain the rules of time travel, then you can make it do whatever you want because time travel doesn't exist. JD says, it's amazing how fast I can lose interest in a story that doesn't follow its own rules. Exactly. You know, by the way, I can, I have an argument of why we know we never discover time travel. And it's because I look at the world and the mess it is. And I think if somebody had discovered time travel, they would have come back and fixed this. And I had that theory for a long time. And it kind of hurt a little bit because I want time travel to exist. I want to be able to go back and fix things and change things or go to the future and learn things and bring it back. And, you know, those abilities, I think it's awesome. And how cool would it be to be able to jump back and to, uh, you know, to meet Albert Einstein or, uh, you know, go back and see Queen live in concert once because, you know, you didn't get a chance to before Freddie Mercury died. Those kind of things. Time travel will be great for that. But when I thought about, you know, somebody would have made changes already, it made me think that time travel never happens. Or, you know, if in your lifetime you could fix time travel, wouldn't you have already jumped back? And then I thought, well, wait a minute. What if somebody already has... What if things were so bad that someone jumped back, fixed things, and this is the better reality? This is the best they could get it. And I think that depressed me even more. So what do you guys think? Do you think time travel will ever figure out how to do time travel? Josh says, unless we need to go through what's happening now for time travel to be created, if people come back and improve things, it would stop the creation of the time machine itself. That is possible. But also no humans. And they would still do it. JD says, I don't think so. We could be capable of it, but future us may have a General Order One. Hmm. You mean like a prime directive type of thing? You know, can't go back and change things. You also can't go back and get yourself a Michael Jordan rookie card or a Hornus Wagner card or a Superman number one. Uh, oh, yeah, I, 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 time travel is just crazy. 
Um, what's funny is there's a company in England that does little like radio programs and they get actors and they came in and they reached out to me about a year or so back and asked me to write like a 10 minute story. And I took my time travel theory and I have it play out in the conversation between two friends at a, like a, uh, an English version of Starbucks. And uh, they're talking about time travel and, and, and the theory I just put out there. So there is a 10 minute radio program out there called the trouble with time travel that I wrote that is performed. And, uh, you know, and it, it just runs off of the theory I have about time travel. Josh says, that's why there's a secret force of time travel assassins that come back and kill the rogue travelers who break the rules. The TTA, their time traveler association or the time variance association. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. JD says, I like the idea from Interstellar. Future humans can travel, but they are so advanced and far removed from our current experience that they wouldn't know what to change. Ooh. Josh says, see my upcoming comic I just invented right now. Time Killers, issue number one, on stands never. <laughs> well, Josh, you can write it whenever you want and just come back and put it on the stands tomorrow. Or today, since it's new comic day. Just travel back and have it come out today. Trouble B says, there's an old episode of Art Bell where he talked to a guy who said he tra time travel. Oh, Art Bell. I haven't heard, I haven't thought about Art Bell in a very long time. Uh, the scary part is that the crazy people that used to be on Art Bell, now they're in Congress. <sighs> All right, let's take our second break, and then we'll come back, and we'll talk about the season finale of The Rings of Power. We'll be right back. Join the party. Head over to our link tree to find all the links for everywhere the experience is all the time. Comic Collectibles is here for you every Wednesday with AR Comics for two very important reasons. To sell you rare, one-of-a-kind comics that you'll love, and to confuse AR with old man talk. You see, Rex and John are, how should I put this, uh, ancient as the roots of the mountains. So every week, Rex and John fill in AR in yet another area of pop culture that he missed because he's too young, just didn't have the time, or just really doesn't care about. It's a real public service they provide. Come buy some super rare and unique comics, while old men explain long-dead sci-fi shows to a younger man making that confused puppy face. Every Wednesday from 6 to 8 Eastern with Rex, John, and AR Comics. Comic Collectibles, on the experience. Comic culture and sales. folks we are back we're going to talk about the rings of power in just a minute but first jd what's today's schedule like well today we have a uh, delightful menu of delights for you 
uh, lined up. We do have uh, Comic Collectibles coming up next, Rex and John, and AR Comics joining them. They have some really cool stuff lined up, a lot of good CCAs. And as the we saw at the beginning, the Silk, Se Silk Spectre uh, statue uh, for sale today. After that, we've got the Jesse James Talk Show. We made a change from the sales show. It's He's uh, basically giving an insider look at the world of owning and running a comic book shop uh, every Wednesday and su uh, Sunday now. So if you want to stick around that interests you, if you have your own comic book shop, it's definitely something to listen for. And after that, it's Wednesday Warriors with Joey and Ambrosia talking about new comic book day. Very cool. So, all right. I was thinking during the break, what's the one thing that always comes up when people talk about time travel? The one of going back and killing Hitler, right? I mean, that that's that's usually the one that comes up. I know everybody's go back by this, go and do that, but killing Hitler is the one that always comes along. But have you noticed that that's the philosophical question of would you be willing to kill somebody, you know, that's innocent before they do something because of what they might do in the future? But that's not the only way you could solve the problem. You could stop Hitler in a much more peaceful way by simply buying his art, becoming his patron. Whenever he paints something, just buy it. Just show up going, oh, Adolf, love the sunflowers. I'll take it. 200, there you go. What are you going to paint next? Just become his biggest fan, buy his work, get other people to buy his work, and he becomes a happy painter. Because it was the failure of painting that made him go and do everything else. So you don't need to kill baby Hitler. That's, that's cold. You don't need to kill anybody. Just become a patron of the arts. Like you can do with us. With our membership services. You should check that out. That may be the best segue connection ever. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's the whole plot of Moon Knight. The experience sort of like time traveling remote viewing. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Let's talk Rings of Power. Um, I really enjoyed the Rings of Power series. Let me say that first. I thought they handled a lot of really good stuff in it. Um, it's a to me it expands. I'm not a Tolkien aficionado. I enjoyed the Lords of the Rings movies. I enjoyed the Hobbit movies. I like the universe. I have tried to read Lord of the Rings. I've never tried to listen to it audio to Audible or audio which I may do, but it was such a hard book to get through. Um, but I do, J, uh, Slip says, what if changing Hitler makes someone else rise up in his place who's much worse than him? Always a possibility. But if just getting rid of Hitler is the question, you can do it without killing him. I'm just saying. There is another option. Everybody always goes for the kill baby Hitler. No. You can do it another way. It's always a better way. Josh says, I think you need to work on that sales pitch, Dan. Send us super thanks, you know, like Hitler. Prevent the rise of the Fourth Reich? Make a donation? No. Uh, Triple B, how, how many rings are in the movies? Because this one only made three in this one. What they're doing... Ah, great question, Triple B. They're going to basically cover the creation of the rings. There are three elf rings that get made first, and they're the only ones made without Sauron's direct influence. He was gone by the time they were made. There were nine rings, no, seven rings made for the dwarfs, nine rings for man, and then one ring to rule them all. So we'll see the creation of those rings in this series. The whole series is about the creation of the rings. So the one ring hasn't been created yet and won't be created till all the other ones are done. So we're likely to see um, what 
the dwarfs will probably become more important going forward because it'll be their turn to make the rings. And then we'll see the ones made for man, which, like I said, I believe is nine. So I think there's nine and seven. Uh, I think there's 19 total rings and 19 or 20. So I think, I think the dwarfs are actually six rings, not seven. But there's a confusing a confusion about there. Sometimes there seems to be seven, but so we get to see the that's what the purpose of this last episode was. We get the creation of the three rings. We get the reveal of who Sauron is. And we at least get confirmation what the stranger is, if not who. So Three rings for the elven kings under the sky, seven for the dwarves lords in their halls of stone, nine for mortal men doomed to die, one for the dark lord on his dark throne in the land of Mordor. Okay, so yeah, it was three, seven, and nine plus one. So that's a total of 16, 20, yeah. So through the five seasons, we'll get all 20 rings. Um I am happy with the series overall, but I have a complaint. And my complaint is that from the beginning, it seemed really obvious that Halbrand was going to be Sauron. So much so that I figured it couldn't possibly be the case. Too obvious. No way. Too obvious. Halbrand is Sauron. The stranger. The stranger has the whole thing with. Uh, he, he feels like he's Gandalf. Now it doesn't make sense for him to be Gandalf, because in the Tolkien writing, Sauron is the first wizard to come down. Then, the blue wizards come down. Then Gandalf and Radagast, but they don't come down till the third age. We're still in the second age. So none of the wizards we know should be on Middle-earth now. So unless he comes down and then goes back up to the Ishtar and then comes back down later, it can't be Gandalf, but it really feels like they're trying to make the stranger into Gandalf. Some of the lines he says are almost identical to Gandalf's lines. Um... There's in, in Lord of the Rings, he talks about talking to Pip uh, Pippin about following his nose. He says that to Nori. The stranger says, you know, follow your nose. And, you know, and they do outright call him part of the Ishtar. They, and uh, that translates to wizard, wise man or wizard. So he is definitely part of the Ishtar. And he would be one of the wizards. Is he Gandalf? God, it really feels like they're trying to make it so. And again, I don't feel like he should be. Just like Halbrand shouldn't have been Sauron because Sauron um, came to Celebrimbor in a different guise. He showed up as an elf, uh, who, the, the elf lord of, uh, of gift giving, and he gave him these ideas and stuff. So they're making changes outright. And it's like um, Gladriel's husband is not supposed to be dead, but we're told that uh, Kelebor is dead already. So they're, they're making changes that I'm assuming that they're going to fix later on to line it back up, but it's kind of weird at this point. That said, really like what they did. It's an entertaining story. <laughs> no, it's cool, Triple, Triple B, and uh, JD's my backup. If I if I stumble on something, he knows to hit Google and uh, fill in fill in for what old age is forgetting. So, but I I was right actually. I had the right number. I just couldn't remember if the uh, dwarfs were seven or six. So, but yeah. Um, I think they did a really good job. I think it looks epic. The whole series felt like 
it was part of the uh, Peter Jackson movies, you know, and, and normally you see, you know, there's a TV movie or uh, there's a movie and then they do a TV show based off of it. And it doesn't look anything. It doesn't feel the same. It feels like a TV show. This had that big budget epic scope that I was surprised they were able to do. And I know they spent a fortune on this, but I thought it was cool. You know, I thought they did a really good job. I am really looking forward to season two. I don't know when that's going to be. I got to look up and see uh, if they have an idea of when it's going to be released. And hopefully it's not too long. Because if we're supposed to go five seasons, I'm hoping they get these things out at least once a year. Because if not, then these actors are going to age up and age up and age up. And where most of them, it doesn't really matter. But at no point do I think the guy playing Elrond is ever going to look like Hugo Weaving. So we don't want him to age up too much. You know? I could see Galadriel starting to look like um, Kate Blanchett. There's enough similarity. But the Elrond guy does not look that much like Hugo Weaving. To the fact that he was also cast to play young um, Ned Stark in Game of Thrones, and I don't think he looks like uh, Sean Bean either. So, all right, guys, looks like we're coming up to the end of the show. Didn't talk too much about uh, Rings of Power, but if you have any questions about the series, anything you'd like me to go more in depth of, let me know, and I'll be happy to dig a little deeper into it and cover it. Uh, you can do that tomorrow or anytime next week. We're going to have a little bit of a slowdown. We've been covering She-Hulk and all these shows, and now we're slowing down a little bit. We'll still have Andor. We'll still have Quantum Leap. I'll probably start looking at the third season of uh, Pennyworth, maybe the new Teen Titans, but what we're going to cover. So if there's anything you guys want, like Ed, Ed asked for a, a primer on Black Adam, I'm going to do that tomorrow. So if there's anything you guys want me to cover, want to know more about, just let me know, and we'll see when we can work it into the show. So stick around for Comics Collectibles and then Jesse James and Wednesday Warriors. Great lineup here. And check out our membership services, and we'll see you all later. Have a great night. Get the inside scoop on everything happening in the experience every week. Join our mailing list by scanning the QR code at the bottom of the screen and then watching your email inbox.